Good afternoon YouTube, this is Hipster Preacher and this video is one of many that's going to be posted on YouTube in a debate or discussion of whether tithing is still a biblical obligation or if it ended with Christ in the New Testament. Um, we know uh, what I'm going to do is try to lay the groundwork starting in Genesis there was mentioned the first time in Genesis 14 20 that there was tithing but it doesn't mention if it tied before if they tied after that um, or anything else until it talks about Genesis 28 verses uh, 20 through 22 when Jacob had the miraculous dream uh, then it talked about tithing again and during that you uh, see that throughout the Bible we see tithing is the giving of the first fruits um, and a lot of people say well we don't harvest the fruits you know do we go and drop off a, a basket of apples to the church um, but but right now we're going to talk about monetarily tithing to the church not the uh, not the fruit or wheat or hops, whatever you grow in your area. Um, and I know that I'm speaking right now in the Old Testament, but I figured that this would go ahead and lay the groundwork of where we're trying to go with this discussion. Um, I don't want to make just one video uh, an hour long of everything that I can look up and find where it states biblically we're going to go ahead and need to tithe but you know we'll, we'll keep it at a short period of time let him come in anybody else you're welcome to debate as well post responses post replies whatever that works um, and what we're looking at is uh, uh, the practice even in the New Testament I found that tithing was in the New Testament uh, and so you've got where uh, if we don't tithe, how is the church going to remain in operation? A pastor can't come out of his own pocket. He can't go ahead and just say, okay, I'm going to have a church. I'm going to pay everything out of my own pocket, and we're going to have church. Uh, it would be great if that's how it could work, and you could just have your congregation show up to a building and everybody hears the word of God and, you know, everything's free. But to keep the lights on, keep the heat on, keep the AC on, it all costs money. Um, we in a church have the obligation to be good stewards of our money. Now, there are churches that are out there that aren't good stewards. There's people that aren't good stewards. Um, so it's kind of a... I don't want to call anybody out or say, you know, they're horrible stewards of their money as a church because they're the ones that have to answer for that, not me. And uh, we need to seek our rewards in heaven. And that's where we're going to be rewarded tenfold. We're going to have abundance of rewards when we come into heaven. And um, with that, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that we're going to go ahead, um, it's kind of going to be a, I'm going to talk, then he's going to post a video, then I'm going to post a video, he's going to post a video back and forth, and hopefully this is a very interesting debate, and I hope that you guys get something out of it, and you know, even, even myself, I hope I get something out of it, so anyway, I hope you continue to tune in, and watch this debate and if you want to get in on it feel free like I said before um, you're always welcome and that's it for today so thank you have a blessed day because you see the problem in religion is everyone uses the same labels tithing salvation born again Jesus God but they define those terms in radically different ways so the first issue with tithing is this how do we define tithing and might I suggest that the Bible defines tithing. Le Leviticus 27.30 says that tithing is food. Malachi chapter 3, 
verse 9 and 10, it says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. So again, it's food. What were the Pharisees tithing in Matthew 23, 23? And that's before the cross, because the new covenant came in according to the book of Hebrews at the cross. So this is still old covenant, Matthew 23, 23. What were they tithing? It wasn't money. Is three types of spices. So I put it to you, past race, that firstly, tithing is food, not money. Secondly, this is not a debate about giving. I'm not here to discuss giving. The debate is on tithing. And the issue is, are Christians still under the Levitical tithe laws? If you say that they are, then aren't you saying, well, we're partly saved by the new covenant, we're kind of 95% saved by the new covenant, and 5% saved by keeping parts of the Levitical covenant, i.e. tithing? Hey, that's what the Seventh-day Adventists do. They, they believe that we're saved mostly by the New Covenant, about 80%. But 20% we're saved by tithing, not eating shellfish, not eating lobster, not eating crab. And they claim they keep the Sabbath. They don't, of course, but they claim they keep the Sabbath and other Sabbath laws. So, you know, can you mix in salvation the New Covenant, a little bit of the New Covenant with a little bit of the Old Covenant and shake them together and that's what salvation is? Right, two points to finish with. The first point is that tithing was a system of taxation for the nation of Israel and in the Levitical covenant. Um, there were three tithes, the, um, I'll go into this later, three tithes, and they had between 10 and 13 offerings. So it was like our modern day taxation system in Britain or in America. You don't just have one tax, you have a whole range of taxes that you have to pay. And uh, if you believe that you're under these uh, Levitical tithe laws, then if you're paying 10%, you're definitely stealing from God because the total amount paid would have been somewhere around 25 to 30%. The second thing is, yes, you mentioned Abraham uh, tithing before the law. This was a one-off tithe. Perhaps I'll go into this in a separate video later on. But bear in mind that in Genesis 17, Abraham was circumcised together with his household before the law. He also kept slaves before the law. And in Genesis 22, um, he offered a burnt offering before the law. So if you believe we have to pay a tithe because Abraham tithed before the law, then you must also keep burnt offerings, Pastor Race, you must keep slaves, and you must be circumcised. I think my time is up, so over to you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and post uh, another video for our debate on whether tithing is biblical or not. Uh, hopefully this one I won't be as nervous as I was during the first one, um, so bear with me. This is only my second video ever putting up on YouTube other than the ones where you got to see my kids climbing the walls and making basketball shots. Uh, where we're going to start at is uh, I found while I was researching and everything else, there's ten reasons to tithe. The first is honor to the Creator. In Matthew 22 and 20, Matthew 22, 21, render unto God the things that are God's. God owns everything that's in the planet. God owns everything from your house to what you make to everything. Everything is God's. Um, and any Christian would definitely not deny that fact. Um, and during that, you can also go through and find in scripture where it says God owns the entire world and its substances. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalms 24, 1. Behold, all souls are mine. Ezekiel 18, 4. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. Haggai 2, 8. Now, going through that, you can see that everything belongs to God. So, why wouldn't we give to God what is God's um, and just to answer some questions that were brought up um, in the comment section I appreciate everybody's comments I'm sorry if I wasn't able to answer each and every one of your comments because of the fact that it would lay out my entire argument in the comment section and it wouldn't be conducive to uh, us posting videos back and forth with each other so I'm going to try to go ahead and answer some of those questions as well as laying out the biblical reasons for tithing. Um, so going through that, 
Abraham was the first one to tithe, and he was the first one on record in Genesis 14.20. Abraham's grandson Jacob paid tithes. Scripture says that Levi, Abraham's descendant and father of the tribe of the form which priesthood came, paid tithes in Abraham. My heritage to pay a tithe precedes the law of Moses. As a child of Abraham and an heir of the promise of Abraham, I acknowledge my family relationship by paying tithes. And also, Jesus said to the Jews, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the work of Abraham. And that's in John 8, 3, 39. It would be strange to claim to be a child of Abraham, yet neglect one of Abraham's most fundamental and noteworthy acts. I pay my tithes as a scriptural descendant of Abraham, the father of the faithful. Um, also in the comments, some of you said that we're talking about the old law as opposed to the new law, where Abraham would pay a tithe, but he was under the old law. But this was before the law was even laid out. This was before uh, he even the law was there of Moses. So we're looking at uh, tithing from the point of view uh, of this is what's gone on prior to us, and you should tithe to your church for the following reasons. Um, to fulfill the covenant. For if that which is done away with glorious, much more than which remaineth is glorious. 2 Corinthians 3.11 So, uh, going through there, I'm going to go ahead and pull uh, up on my phone what I found today, um, which I uh, honestly really liked. Um, it pretty much laid out my entire argument on what uh, what I wanted to talk about. Um, this is this is from uh, I guess he would be Pastor Tim Brown, uh, where the question was asked about tithing. Uh, tithing began before the law was introduced. The law simply regulated the tithe. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. 400 years before the time of Moses and the law. And according to Romans 14.12, we are to walk in the footsteps of the faith of Abraham. If tithing was good for him, it should be good for us too. Um, in the comments, uh, I can't remember your name, sir, but uh, you had posted that uh, we should have a free church where... The staff is not paid for, the preacher doesn't receive a wage, the preacher is there to just uh, minister the Word of God. Um, and, and I've seen a lot of things in there where I caught flack for saying my opinion, how I feel, um, but this is the only way I can do it because... I can interpret scripture in a complete different way than what you would interpret the scripture. Um, how I interpret it um, is that, yes, we are under obligation to tithe. Um, do we, you know, is it bound by law? In scripturally, I would have to say yes. Yes, it is. And... Um, Going through that, we'll go ahead and move down to, uh, some will argue that Jesus' words are not applicable to us today because Jesus was under the law and spoke to those under the law. Their theory goes something like this. Jesus was, given an instruction to the, was giving an instruction to the Jews, so his words are not binding to us. Um, but if you look, Jesus said, you should have practiced, okay, sorry about that, Matthew 23, 23, we'll go ahead and take a look at that right there, uh, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you have a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. 
you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former, which means that they should practice justice, mercy, and faithfulness without neglecting the tithe. Um, and, and I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, do I operate a church? Do I receive my money um, from a church? Do I expect parishioners to tithe to me? My ministry is completely different. Um, I, I operate a PTSD ministry for soldiers who are affected by PTSD. Um, I can tell you that this is how much money I make from my ministry. Zero. Nada. I don't expect anybody to tithe to me. I don't expect any money from anybody. Um, I, I live a comfortable way uh, on my own. I, I, I don't need to have people tithe to me because I don't have a full-time ministry. Well, it is full-time, but I, I don't have a brick-and-mortar church. I don't need to have somebody tithe to pay my light bill. Um, so, with that, uh, we'll keep moving along. Uh, then you'll say, people will say that um, tithing was only uh, agricultural. You gave food, you gave what you grew, the first seed, which, truthfully, yeah, okay, I agree with that. But in today's world... Uh, how many of you actually grow cumin? How many of you actually grow uh, your own vegetables? And, and can a church operate on what you're giving them as far as vegetables, as far as um, that? I mean, we don't barter anymore. We don't trade. I mean, I guess in some parts of the country, bartering is still uh, legitimate. But uh, I don't know. I mean, Paul also uses the pattern of tithing under the law in 1 Corinthians 9, 13 to 14. It says, Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Which is going back to saying what what I was saying is, is that if a pastor of a church is pastoring full time then he should receive wages to allow him to feed his family to allow him to keep the lights on at his church to allow him to uh, keep the ministry growing uh, and we can move on down to uh, looking at uh, let's go ahead and take uh, um, well, here, we'll move on down to here. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to go through my notes here real quick to see. Uh, under the New Covenant, uh, firstlings, which I mentioned before, biblical commands about tithing are generally about green, wine, and oil. A different system of giving was required for some animals. In the last plague on Egypt, God killed the firstborn male of every animal and human, but he spared the Israelites and their animals. Therefore, God claimed ownership of every Israelite firstborn and firstling male animal. And that's in Exodus. What you're saying, why do you go back to the Old Testament? I think we need to build the foundation before we move on. Uh, right now I'm at 11 minutes 32 seconds, so I'm going to go ahead and try to wrap up this video, have it uploaded, and then I'll allow the other speaker to speak. I know this one kind of doesn't make sense, I'm kind of all over the place with it, but I wanted to get this video up. I'm feeling a little bit more comfortable. I'm feeling like, you know, I, I'm starting to get a groove with, uh, with making these videos, so... Uh, the next video that I'll make will be in response. Also, we'll be moving on into the New Testament and the tithing uh, requirement in the New Covenant. Uh, and, and so that is, is where we're at. We're going to go ahead um, and close for the day.
And like I said, you're more than welcome to leave comments, questions, and uh, I might even make a special video if you all make enough comments to go through and I'll pull it up on my phone and I'll go ahead and answer every single question that you have uh, in a video. So I hope you guys have a blessed rest of the day and I'll see you soon. Thanks. Hello Pastor Ace. Uh, thank you for the third debate in our tithing series. I listened with interest to your um, video. I notice you've changed the format from seven minutes. We're now up to the 14 minute 45 second absolute limit video format. Fair enough, I have no problem with that. But I'm concerned because this is not preaching. People aren't going to listen to this series of videos on tithing if you're simply going to come and just preach. It's supposed to be a debate. Uh, it's not a debate with people in text, it's a debate with me. <laughs> okay, Here I am buddy, it's a debate with me. and. You're supposed to be responding to the points that I've raised and saying Robert has says that said this, but actually I disagree because, because, because. And I'm supposed to be responding to the points which you've made and say, well, you know, Pastor Ace has said this and this and this, and this is why I disagree with him. So please, Pastor Ace, this is a debate. This is not a, a preaching session. And it's going to be very boring for the people listening to this if every point I raised is just ignore and you just sort of continue preaching so please do respect that. You are a, a graduate, um, you went to a Baptist seminary. Uh, I never went to a seminary, I do have a university degree from the University of Aberdeen and then a teacher training, postgraduate teacher training certificate from the University of Exeter. So both of us have an academic background and we should understand that the format of, of a debate is that we have equal time in our time segments to speak. You can't just say, hey, I'm going to post some extra videos where I respond to what people say in text. Because you've agreed, Pastor Ace, a debate with me. And in a debate format, we have equal time on camera to put our point of view across. You know, Pastor Ace quoted Matthew 22, 21, Psalm 24, 1 and Haggai 2 8. Psalm 24 1 says that the earth is the Lord's, the fullness, and they that dwell therein. Could you please explain what's the significance of these verses? I understand you quoted them, but how do they relate to tithing? Could you please explain how they relate to tithing? Psalm 24 1 says that the, the, the earth is the Lord's. Um, a person who's a Catholic could say that the Pope is entitled on the basis of Psalm 24 1 not to 10% of your income, but to 100% of your income. You should let your wife and children starve and give your money to the Pope. Because the earth is the Lord's, therefore everything you own is God's. And the Pope is God's representative on earth. So, you know, a medieval Pope could say, I own everything. <laughs> and you must give me 100% of your income, not 10%. Obviously, that's taking the passage completely out of context. But you get my point. Um, just quoting random verses doesn't support tithing. I think you've got to make a case, Pastor Ace. You are a, a graduate, okay? You're a Baptist seminary graduate. Surely your training must allow you to make a theological case um, to back up your position. Would you please do that? Thank you, sir. You next quote Abraham at Genesis 14.20, and you point out that Abraham paid a tithe, well, actually, Abraham didn't just pay a tithe. He gave away everything that he gained from the spoils of war. If you read Genesis 14, 21 down to 24. Now, the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread of thread to a sandal strap that I will not take anything that is yours lest you should say I have made Abraham Abraham rich so Abraham took nothing he gave a hundred percent away um, if you're going to quote this verse um, then shouldn't you if you wish to ob obey this verse which to me seems crazy because this is an ancient taxation system why should a taxation system, where if you fought a, a battle on someone's land, the owner of that land was entitled to 10% of the spoils of the battle, why should a law 
4,000 years ago about ancient taxation apply today in America in the year 2014? I mean, Pastor Ace, do you pay your taxes to the British government? Do you pay your taxes as well to the French and the German and the Dutch and the, and the Italian governments? Do you pay your taxes, Pastor Ace, to the Spanish government? You know, taxes are usually about 30%. Um, maybe a little more, which was actually the rate of um, tithing in ancient Israel under the Mosaic law, because they had three tithes and up to about 13 offerings. And if you were a landowner, you were paying about 25 to 30 percent. But if you said to me, look, Robert, um, we fought the American Revolutionary War to get rid of the Limeys. We don't pay British taxes because I'm an American citizen. OK, I get it. You pay your taxes to the IRS. You, Pastor Ace, do not pay your taxes to the British government because you threw the British out in 1776. So <laughs> British law doesn't apply to you. British taxes don't apply to you, an American citizen. You pay your taxes to the IRS. Well, why on earth um, should you pay in addition to paying your taxes to the IRS? Why are you under a 4,000-year-old code of taxation from Genesis 14? And if you're going to take Genesis 14 then, um, and, and say, that applies to me, Pastor Ace, then why don't you give 100% of all your money away? Because that's what Abraham did. He didn't just pay a 10% tithe. He gave the other 90% away as well. So you want to keep this first, Genesis 14, 20. You've got to give 100% of your income away. And um, on my last video, I think I pointed out that Abraham only tithed once in his life. I think you need to address that, and you haven't. We do find that in Genesis 20, 16, Abraham um, was paid a thousand pieces of silver. And Abimelech said, see, my land is before you. Dwell in it where it pleases you. Genesis 20, 16. Then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before all others. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham received a thousand pieces of silver. He didn't tithe on that. His tithing in Genesis 14 was a once-in-a-lifetime event. It wasn't something he did weekly by direct debit. If you believe that you're under... Um, the pre-Mosaic tithe laws, an ancient form of taxation, because Abraham tithe, therefore you have to do it, then would you please explain Genesis 17, verse 10 to 14, where Abraham, or Abraham as he now was, was circumcised together with his house. Are you circumcised, Pastor Ace? Do you circumcise your male children? You have to. If you believe that Genesis 14 is for today, then Genesis 17, which is before the law, must also be for today. And he didn't just uh, circumcise himself and his children, but his male slaves. Now, do you believe in keeping slaves? You ought to, because Abraham, Abraham kept slaves before the law in Genesis 17. So if Genesis 14, about tithing, must be kept because it was before the law, then you must circumcise... Um, your male children, and you must keep slaves. Also, before the law, Genesis 22, um, 13. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham offered up burnt offerings. So if you believe that you must keep the, the pre-Mosaic tithe laws, a 4,000 year system of taxation today, then you must keep the laws of circumcision, you must keep slaves, and you must offer burnt offerings. You can't have it both ways. Um, you quoted Romans 14, 12, we're to walk in the footsteps of Abraham. Well, come on, buddy, walk in the footsteps of Abraham. Offer burnt offerings in your church. Have an altar, tie up a ram or a lamb or a goat, cut the goat's throat and then burn it on the altar in your church because Abraham did this before the law. And it's inconsistent of you to say that because tithing was before the law, therefore we keep tithing. But we don't, um, we don't keep those other things such as burnt offerings and circumcision and slavery. And what about the Leverite marriage vow? Okay, in the Bible, um, if... 
a man's brother died childless, then before the giving of the law, um, the brother of the dead with um, his sister-in-law and raise up children. Well, we find this in Genesis 38, the story of Onan, 38, 8 and 9. Now this law of the lever was incorporated in Deuteronomy 25 verses 5 to 10 in the Mosaic law with one change, just as tithing was incorporated in the Mosaic law with numerous changes. And that was the new law of the lever. You had to marry the woman. And Jesus approved of the Leverite marriage vow in Matthew 22, 24. So this was before the law, Pastor Ace. If you believe that tithing is for today because it was practiced before the law, then do you practice the law of the lever in your church, which was part of the, which was commanded. I mean, God struck Onan because he broke this um, uh, ancient law. He struck him dead. So do you practice this? If in your church, Pastor Ace, a man dies childless, then do you command on the basis of Deuteronomy 25 verses 5 to 10 that somebody uh, related to that uh, man, his, his brother, has in order to produce children? Because Jesus approved of that, Matthew 22, 24. You then said that Jacob paid tithes, um, according to, I think that's Genesis 28. Well, actually, the verse doesn't say that uh, Jacob paid tithes. Um, Genesis 28, 22. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you shall give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So he promised that he would give a tenth to God, but we never find any instance in the Bible where he kept that vow. Now, Jacob was renamed Israel, and I'm sure he forgot about the vow. There's certainly no record that he ever kept it, but God remembered that vow. So when Jacob was hungry, okay, when he was starving, he sent his ten sons down to Egypt. Genesis 42 verse 3, okay, uh, to buy food with money, okay, and uh, people who love tithing today, they love money, they want the money, but notice that the money was rejected, it was put back into the sacks, but there was a question regarding a silver cup, and so of those ten sons, one of those sons, Judah, was taken, Genesis 44:18. And Judah, who was an ancestor of Jesus Christ, he became the tithe that was kept in prison until the brothers came back. So it's a wonderful story, but God extracted the tithe from Jacob and he extracted it in the form of his son, Judah. Pastor Ace, you then made a statement which left me completely flummoxed. You said, quote, you should tithe to your church to fulfill the covenant. Now, could you please explain which covenant are you talking about? Abrahamic covenant? Mosaic covenant? New covenant? And which Bible verse says that, that you should tithe to your church to fulfill the covenant? Could you please give me a verse which backs up this statement of yours? You then said later on, is it, meaning tithing, bound by the law? And you said, yes, it is. Once again, would you please give me a verse? where um, I, as a Christian, am bound by the law to pay a tithe. Could you please show me a verse? With seconds remaining, I'll make three comments about 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. Firstly, the things that were offered on the altar were food, not money. Secondly, if you look at Nehemiah 10.37, the context isn't tithing in 1 Corinthians 9 at all. You see, you, ne Nehemiah 10.37 says you paid your tithe to the Levites and your offerings to the priests. So the context that the things offered on the altar 
are not tithes, they're offerings. And thirdly, finally, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, have we no right to take along a believing wife? The context here isn't one man ban pastors demanding money. It's Paul defending church supporting missionaries on their missionary trips. Thank you. Greetings, Robert. Um, this, this video is going to um, digress um, with that. I, kn I know it seems unfair. You've put a lot of work into what you have done thus far. Um, but due to the comments and uh, everything else, I feel as though I need to take a step back and regroup, restart where we're at, restart where I'm at, and then uh, move forward from that point. Um, that's the only way that I kind of see the situation either uh, progressing or or not. Um, uh, and, and I'm sure you've seen the comments as well. So anyway, we'll go ahead and just start. I need to start over. And what I'll do, I'll ask you some questions. Uh, hopefully you agree with this format. Again, I apologize. But I've taken time during my vacation to think about how can we bring this back together? How can we go ahead and, uh, I guess, make this uh, debate uh, uh, open for, for others to come along and watch our videos? I apologize for the lighting. Uh, it's kind of uh, terrible in here. So anyway, with that, I'll just go ahead and move on to, uh, I just have a couple questions. Uh, the first one would be, if there was no tithing for a church, how should a church operate? Um, obviously, a church has a budget. Obviously, a church needs to open its doors, turn on the AC, turn on the heat, turn on the lights, um, and it needs you know obviously operating funds uh, now they'll say that there's no amount that is given but the 10 percent is the law uh, from the old testament and and they came across with that where the priests would get uh, sacrifices they would get animals they would get grains and that's how the priests at the time sustained themselves so how would we expect a modern day pastor to sustain themselves with what we are giving them? Uh, as far as I know of, there, there's no federal grants that a church can apply for to say, you know, hey, I want to open up a church at XYZ and all of a sudden here's a federal grant for $800,000 to operate with. It's not there. Um, I understand people saying, well, look at all these churches, look at how well they're doing. Obviously the show, I don't know if you get it where you're at, uh, but we have a show out on their second season called The Preachers of L.A., which definitely does not help uh, the, the image of the pastors uh, here in the States at least, because uh, let me tell you, you got one driving a Ferrari, and he also has a Bentley, and another one living in a mansion, and another one with a nice pool. I, I mean, that's ridiculous. I think that's beyond uh, <clears throat> the scope of blessings that God would bestow upon an uh, individual. And, and I mean, honestly, in my honest opinion, people can say I'm stupid, people can say whatever they want. My, my skin is pretty thick, uh, but I also think that Satan blesses people as well. Um, he's not the, the evil pitchfork horned, you know, with the spiky tail. Uh, he was actually a beautiful angel that fell, so I think he can suck uh, pastors, he can suck people, he can suck anybody into uh, what he wants them to be. 
mega churches such as TD Jakes, Casey Treat, they don't help either. I, I mean, when when you take in on any given Sunday three hundred thousand dollars, you're obviously hurting your congregation. I think, in my opinion, um, they may not feel that way. I do. You know, I don't think a pastor needs to drive a brand new Bentley to to church when you know the rest of the congregation is showing up in a 1998 Ford Ranger pickup truck. Um, and but for the most part, everyday average pastor, they operate within a budget, which is basically large enough to keep the doors open. And I even know a lot of pastors who have work outside of being a pastor they'll you know work a nine-to-five job and then turn around and produce a sermon and preach that sermon on Sunday and that that's it that's all they have sorry I have a sore throat today so I'm trying to keep it keep it uh, moist um, I know that this this debate is strictly on the New Testament. Um, obviously, the the biblical uh, verses that I had given, people didn't like. People said that that's not what it is. I misinterpret the the biblical side. That's another reason why I I feel as though we need to start over. We'll start from the beginning. Start this whole thing back at you know the the operation of the church and as we move forward we'll move into biblical verses for the new testament we'll, we'll move into um what what it is that it takes for a church to operate um but basically that's where I'm at. I, I honestly, prayfully hope that, that you're okay with this format now. Um, like I've told you before in the past, I'm brand new at video debating. I'm brand new at this uh, YouTube stuff. So, you know, this is kind of a learning experience for me as well. And, and, and I hope the people that comment, I hope that you understand that I'm new to this as well. I mean, I'm not trying to come off as a guy that knows everything. I felt as though this was a great debate. It's something I believe in. Um, so, you know, constructive criticism is always welcome. I, I have absolutely zero problem with somebody saying, hey, you're way out in left field. That doesn't bother me at all. You know, I, I would rather have a guy give me constructive criticism rather than criticize what I have to say you know tell me tell me what I'm doing wrong or tell me what you want to hear tell me what you want me to prove tell me you know give me some sort of a guidance this isn't this is not directed at you Robert um, I, I think you're a wonderful guy um, I definitely am glad that I have the pleasure of getting to know you over these videos um, and like I said I, I I am deeply sorry that that I, I would like to start back to the beginning. Again, the questions are, how should a church operate? Where should a church get its operating funds from? And basically, where does where does it say that Jesus stopped the the law of tithing? So those are my questions to you. And I, I would hope that, you know, you could answer those questions, add your own questions, shoot them back to me. I think if we do a question answer, I think that would definitely help out a lot in, in the format of our videos. That's my opinion. And you can definitely tell me no or you don't want to continue this debate. I would love to continue it. I have zero problems. Um, I just felt that this was a better way to start fresh. And uh, I thank you, and I hope you have a blessed day. Thank you very much. Hello, Pastor Ace, and um, thank you for your video. 
this is number six in the series, Is Tithing Biblical? Now, I have problems in that when I've debated in the past, what happens is my, my opponent and myself email each other like mad. And if we change the parameters or the formula or the titles of the debate, we do that in email. You see, people are going to be watching this video to, to learn about tithing. They don't want to have a dialogue between you and me where we're ironing out issues of the debate and the format and things like that. Um, but a lot of your videos seem to be taken up with that sort of um, material, which I, I think you need to learn to do in email with me because people want to get right into a debate on tithing. That's what this debate is titled. I also noticed that you didn't use one single scripture in your last video and you didn't even reply to anything that I've said whatsoever. Now, look, as I listen to your video, I make notes. 148 means 1 minute 48 seconds. Your comments in black and then the comments I'm going to make in red with scriptures in green. Now, you don't, you don't have to do this, but if you write something down, your videos are going to come across as more structured. Again, this is something we could really discuss in email. Um, but um, I think you need to try and make your videos a little bit more structured and you need to actually reply to things that I'm saying because so far a debate has not really taken pace, place, Pastor Ace. Um, you're sort of coming to the mic and you're kind of preaching but you're not responding to anything that I'm saying whatsoever and that's not debating. So perhaps you could try and reply in your next video to some of my points and use scripture because no one's really interested in what you think or what you feel. I'm not interested in what you think or what you feel. I'm interested in thus saith the Lord. What does God say in the Bible? And that's what I'm here to discuss. What does the Bible say on the issue? Now to go through your video very quickly at 1 minute 48 seconds you said um, if tithing doesn't exist today how should a church operate re its funding? That was your first question. At 2 minutes and 20 seconds, you said, quote, 10% is the law. Well, actually, it, it wasn't. Um, it was a tenth, not 10%. And they played three tithes and between 10 and 13 offerings. So um, I think you've got that a little bit wrong. 10%, um, the, the idea of a percentage came in with the Arabs in the 9th and the 10th century. They adopted the concept of a percentage. Um, the children of Israel in the Old Testament and in Jesus' day did not pay 10%. They paid three tenths and then offerings on top. Three minutes and 18 seconds, you mentioned the preachers of L.A. Um, yes, I, I have looked at the series on YouTube. Uh, Jones, Pastor Jones and Dietrich Hatton are both oneness Pentecostals. They're both anti-Trinitarian. And you also mentioned T.D. Jakes, who isn't on that series, but he's another oneness Pentecostal. Um, I found the whole series completely blasphemous and completely um, really indicative of the fact that evangelical Christianity is just destroying itself. Most of these churches are set up not for the benefit of the lost, but, but for the benefit of the pastors. And the money goes to one person in the fellowship in most of these churches. And that's the pastor. He gets all the money. He gets the pension. He gets the salary. He gets the free house. He gets the free car. He gets the perks. And um, in the book of Acts, Acts 2.44, the early Christians had all things in common. There was a daily distribution of food, Acts chapter 6, verse 1, uh, where all the poor people in the church received free food. But the people who worked in the church went to the front of the queue and they received the best food. That was all that people who worked in the church, like, like elders, received. Um, but today, Christianity is very much a business. At 5 minutes and 35 sec seconds, you mention a pastor's work, a pastor doing a 9 to 5 job. Well, I would argue there's no such thing as a pastor. The word pastor actually means one who shepherds the flock. And churches were always run in the New Testament by a plurality of elders. No exceptions. Acts 14, 23, they appointed elders, plural, in every church. And that's how churches were run. Never, never, never by a one-man band pastor. And what pastors did in Acts 20, verses 33 to 35, Paul explains that he worked. He worked in a secular work 
to support himself. And the attitude in the church was, we will support missionaries with money, missionaries of people who are going to preach to the lost. Um, in fact, what you and I are doing, you in your hospital ministry and me online. But we're not going to um, support people who are preaching to the saved. Now, what's happened is through Constantine, when Constantine wanted to use Christianity as um, a means of control of his empire, Constantine and the, the subsequent Roman emperors, what they did was they said, well, let's control um, the, the churches. OK, and we'll do that by having a pyramid structure, the same way that the Roman Empire was run, a pyramid structure with a pastor on top or a minister or a priest. They used to call them priests. And we'll pay him a lot of money. He'll get a free house. He'll get slaves. He'll get a chariot. He'll get the best food. We'll really pay him very well. Then we've got that person rather than be persecuted and throw, being thrown to the lions as they were in the, you know, 20, 30 years previously. Constantine now elevated one man band pastors or priests over churches. They did away with the um, biblical concept of a plurality of eldership and by paying them a lot of money um, most of these people ended up being really servants of the Roman Emperor and um, doing his bidding. Not servants of Christ but servants of the state. And we see the same thing today. Much of the um, evangelical church in America is nothing other than a business. Many of these churches have uh, 501c3 status so that, so that the church pastors um, can receive extra income and um, they don't pay um, money in taxes to the, to the church. And, uh, churches are just a business today in most cases. And here in the UK, Islam is certain to take over because Christianity is just destroying itself. At six minutes and four seconds, you said this debate was strictly on the New Testament. No, it wasn't. I never agreed to that. You've just um, um, <laughs> you've just made that up. Um, so again, you need to email me, Pastor Ace. These are the sort of things we discuss in email. I'm quite happy to discuss how churches were funded. It wasn't the uh, debate that I agreed to, but I'm quite happy to do that because I think it's um, it's related to tithing. Uh, at 7 minutes and 20 seconds, you worry about people who comment in text. Now, I've asked you several times, do you want me to disable text? And again, you're not dialoguing with me. You're not giving me an answer. And so we're wasting time in video after video after video where you go on about people who write in text. What will happen to these videos, eventually yours and mine, is they are currently being downloaded and they'll probably be edited into one single video. I'll then delete all of my videos. So all the comments will disappear. They won't exist. And the um, video will then be uploaded to YouTube as a single continuous video. So don't worry about the comments. If you want me to disable them, send me an email. But let's actually get into the Bible. Let's discuss scripture and let's please stop uh, talking about extraneous things. At 8 minutes and 48 seconds, you ask, where does Jesus Christ stop the law of tithing? That was your third question. Um, Jesus never stood up and said, I annul the law of tithing. But the whole of the Levitical law was annulled by Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection. So Hebrews 7.18 talked about the law being annulled because the law could never save people. The law is just a schoolmaster to drive people to Christ, to see their need of a saviour. And Hebrews 8.13 says that the law is obsolete. At nine minutes, you say we could do Q&A. Well, we can't, Pastor Ace, we can't do Q&A if you don't respond to anything that I say. So you need to make notes, write down as I've done, scribble down what I've said and start responding to some of my comments because this is getting very frustrating for me. Um, I have pointed out that uh, tithing in the Le Levitical law, Leviticus 27.30 was food. Um, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat, that's food, food in my house, Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. The Pharisees were tithing food at Matthew 23, 23. And the things that were offered on the altar, 1 Corinthians 9, 13, was food. They didn't uh, put silver on the altar and burn silver and gold and then the priests were eating the silver and gold. It was food. No response from you. You need to reply. As for 1 Corinthians 12, sorry, 1 Corinthians 9, um, this is not talking about 
ministers, one-man band pastors or, or priests or ministers. This is talking about missionaries, because if you look at 1 Corinthians 9 verse 5, uh, Paul mentions about taking along a believing wife. That's not taking along a believing wife to a church. It's taking along a believing wife on a mission trip. Now I'm going to respond to your three Pacific questions. Pastor Ace's first question was this. If there is no tithing today, then how should a church operate re its funds? My answer is it should be run just like the synagogues operated. See, God instituted the tribe of Levi to be the priests and the teachers to Israel. But what happened is they became so corrupt, they weren't teaching the Bible. They were just receiving all the tithes. They were receiving tithes, they were receiving payment, but they weren't teaching the people. And so the synagogue system uh, arose, just, you know, slightly before Jesus's time as a means of teaching the people. And the people who taught in the synagogue did so unpaid. It was, it was one of the biggest sins in Judaism to receive money for preaching. And all the synagogue was, was was a building. If the building needed repair, then people just spent a day repairing the building. There were no salaries, there were no pensions, there were no free houses, there were no free cars. The synagogues didn't really cost anything to run because no one was getting paid. And if you wanted to give some money to the synagogue, synagogue there was a box in the back of the synagogue and you put the money in the box and that was how you supported it through giving not through enforced tithing second question was um, pastor ace asked uh, he said the 10 percent is the law now could you please show me the verse which says that if you look at, look at leviticus 27 32 you will find that the children of israel gave a tenth they didn't give 10%. The whole idea of a percentage came in with the Muslims in the 9th and 10th century. They um, adopted and, and promoted the idea of percentages. Um, so the children of Israel gave a tenth. For instance, they had Leviticus 27.32. If you had uh, 10 newborn lambs, then you had a rod, and you made the lambs pass under the rod, and the tenth lamb that was the tithe. If you had 19 lambs born that year, you made all 19 go under the rod, and the 10th, that was the tithe. So if you had 19 lambs, and they went under the rod, but only one of those lambs was the tithe, then actually your tithe would be specifically 5.5%. It's more complicated than that because there were actually three tithes that you had to pay, and up to 13 offerings. The first tithe was the Levitical tithe, Numbers 18, 20 to 21. The second tithe was the festival tithe, Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 26. And the third tithe was the poor tithe, Deuteronomy 14, 28 to 29. So you want to keep tithing today, then pay three tithes and 13 offerings. Every seventh year, the whole nation was excluded from tithing. That, in, that was called the Smita cycle, Exodus 23, 10. And every 50 years, there was the Jubilee, where once again, you did not pay any tithes. Leviticus 25, 10 to 11. So how many churches keep this? How many churches pay three tithes and up to 13 offerings today? And how many churches today uh, say every seventh year and every 50 years, there is a whole year when you're excluded from tithing? None. Because the whole concept of tithing today is a modern invention to support this uh, heresy of a one-man band pastor clergy class. In fact, it's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans of Revelation chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. Nicolaitans, Nikos meaning to conquer and Laos meaning the people. Uh, a clergy class who conquer, who dominate, who control the people. Very evil. Your third question, I think I've already answered. Where does Jesus Christ stop the law of tithing? I quoted Hebrews 7.18, which talked about the law being annulled. And Hebrews 8.13, the law of God is now obsolete. Because the law of God is a schoolmaster, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. It's a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. Christ saves people, not keeping the law. Hey, Robert, Pastor Ace here. Uh, just got done reviewing your uh, uh, last um, video that you had uploaded. Uh, I took lots of notes, took your advice. Here's, uh, here's my notes that I've been taking. 
and uh, the only thing I can say is that you have proverbially kicked my butt. Um, I went through, researched everything, looked at everything. I honestly have to concede that uh, at the moment you are correct. Um, nothing biblical um, states it other than uh, when Abraham and then also when Jesus had sent them out uh, saying to give freely. Um, other than that, I, I mean, there's nothing that says a tenth is a tithe is a tithe that needs to be given by law. Um, maybe somebody else knows of something that I don't know that can post in there. Um, you you brought up um, a lot of great points, uh, just like the the church during uh, the period uh, Acts six one. Uh, when everybody basically sold everything, turned it all in, and uh, it, everything ran smooth until people started taking advantage of the system. And, you know, we know what happens there. You're right, pastor does refer to a shepherd, and, uh, and it, is never a plur it is never a singular. There is plural. You have deacons, you have elders. The, the pastor answers to. Uh, so you're correct on that. Um, also in Acts you had stated around uh, 5 minutes 4 seconds that Paul worked in a secular job. He was a tent maker or a leather smith. Uh, you're right, he did. Um, definitely uh, that and uh, Let's see what else. Here in America, like you had stated, at 6 minutes 47 seconds, um, churches are afforded the 501c3. Um, and, and that's the truth. Um, actually, the, the law here, I, I know the law in our state, the state that I'm in, if you open up a church, you're automatically granted a tax-free exemption. Um, but it's better to go file the 501c3 so that way when people give donations, you're able to give them the receipt as a tax write-off. Um, let's see here. What else did we got? Um... You said Matthew twenty three twenty three priests got food, not money. True, I I, I concede to that. Um, let's see here. You also said in a synagogue, the teaching of Judaism, no salary, and money was in a box. Correct. Um, the only thing I can say is. <laughs> You won. You got me. I, I got nothing. Um, I, I Man, I, I looked everything up. I researched probably more than I've ever researched in my life to uh, come up with something or to uh, at least have a rebuttal for, for this argument. But with that, I, I, I mean... I'm at a loss. The only thing I, I would do is is waste your time. Um, it definitely was a pleasure getting to know you. I, I learned a lot from you. And uh, I hope maybe sometime in the near future you and I can have a discussion on something else. Uh, but for right now, I concede. You, uh, you definitely opened my eyes to a totally different... Uh, perspective than what I had uh, had viewed um, I was under the assumption you know my parents taught me everybody has taught me tithing 10% 10% um, but finding proof I can't do it man I can't do it you you won sir my hat's off to you and uh, I definitely want to uh 
hold further discussions with you should you so choose. Uh, you're a great guy, like I said, and uh, I definitely learned a lot. Um, I, I enjoyed our our back and forth. You are definitely somebody who who uh, is very studious, and uh, I, I enjoyed learning from you. So uh, I hope this meets you well, and uh, you'll be in my prayers. Thanks a lot, Robert. Bye. I'd like to thank you, Pastor Race, for speaking to me. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. And I found this um, discussion or debate on tithing extremely interesting and useful for me also because it helps to organise your thoughts. And I like listening to people's objection because when I listen to people's objections, I go back to my Bible, I re-examine the Bible, and I examine what I believe in the light of the Bible to see whether, whether it's accurate.